uh, enunciate how those, what are the harms, what are the benefits, and which and how each one is weighted uh, as to how we come up with a decision. I mean, well, I, John uh, Adam, speaking back to you, uh, we're we're gu guided by the town bylaw and and what we uh, see, and it is subjective and it is objective, and that's why we're on this board to make those decisions. I'm not going to really, um, you know, weighted and charting and, 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 and those things, those could be great um, for some people, but uh, I've been here, I've listened and I'm ready to move forward with our process and what other ha happens with the planning board and other boards and building permits doesn't concern me. I mean, um, and I'm, I'm ready to, to move on. Um, I get it. It's not, uh, popular and there's concerns and there's um, things that aren't the best. But uh, to me, when you look at the whole project as a whole, uh, would I rather something different in that location? Absolutely. But we've been guided by council not to judge it at, other than what it is. It's a retail location. We can't judge it as a uh, nasty corporation that some people allege that it is. We can't judge it on, on, on those grounds um, just because we don't like something. Um, we don't have the ability to discriminate against it. Adam, I don't think anybody here is suggesting that that is so, what, uh, you know, I, I'm suggesting that we follow the bylaw. And do well, it I, I agree with you. We, we, uh, I agree, John. We, should follow, we, we will follow the bylaw. But it yeah. sounds like it's been prejudged already. But Well, we're, I think we're here at the point where we're, we're ready to vote. We've been through public hearings since January. Um, we've, we've been through public hearings. We've had uh, more public comment. We've had more peer review comment. We've had uh, a binder full of documentation of uh, traffic engineering studies, peer review traffic studies, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I don't know what more metric, what, what, what the public should do more if people are for it or against it or what the applicant should do. I mean, we're at a point where we've been at public hearings through f for this project since January. And, you know, I can't see <clears throat> anything that would be, that would be a weighted metric or do check marks or anything that would be any more beneficial for, for anybody than maybe, you know, I'm not here as a politician, as a political career to say, I supported it because of this, this, and this, or, or not. It's not that I support <clears throat> the applicant per se. It is commercial developable property. And the applicant has worked with us in our opinion. And in my opinion, the criteria that we've gone over so far, they've met the requirement. Uh, meeting the requirement would be outweighs the benefit versus the detriment. Okay, uh, Mr. Sakolowski made a motion. Do we have a second on that to move forward? I did not make a motion yet. I said, I oh, I'm sorry. I, I will did. make a motion that we move forward uh, to continue the deliberations that we uh, stopped last time. Do I have a second? Yes. Okay, we have yep. a second. Mr. Decker gives us a second. All right, <clears throat> on the deliberation now, some of your questions are going to be answered are going to be answered by attorney Costa about how we can proceed on this. Uh, and I think uh, Mr. Costa, you want to address that now or you want to wait till we get done with going through the criteria? Because there was a question about how to vote, how the vote was going. And I think members kind of need to know um, how we're going to proceed with this or we can wait till the end. It's, it's whatever you think is more comfortable. I'm, I'm not sure what your question is, Mr. Chairman. Well, when we go through and draw up an order of conditions, I don't want to speak out of turn here, but my understanding is when we draw, when we vote on this, you're going to come up with order of conditions and are in either for or against the applicant. And then we're going to vote on what you come up with. Is that correct? Well, well, well not, not entirely. So, um, well, so I want to be careful about using the term order of conditions because an order of conditions is something issued by the conservation commission and, and uh, not something issued by the zoning board. Um, so oh, I'm sorry. Um, whatever, whatever we talked about, though. Well, a, a decision. So, so the the process that got underway at the last meeting of the board after the board voted to close the public hearing was the board began deliberating, and I, I know there's been some discussion already tonight about 
a motion to, con to, to enter deliberations. There, does, there don't need to be any more motions. You've, you're, you're in the deliberation stage. You have an agenda. On your agenda is continued deliberations at a public meeting. We're in a public meeting. And so the only thing that needs to occur now is you need to pick up where you left off. And where you left off was the board began deliberating the standard in the zoning bylaw, whether the benefits of the proposed project outweigh the detriments. And the six factors, the fix, six criteria that are identified in your zoning bylaw as the bases for making that determination. We got through three of those prior to you suspending deliberations uh, several weeks ago. We're now at a further public meeting and you presumably will continue deliberating on the remaining three criteria of those six, bringing it back around to the question of whether the benefits outweigh the detriments. Once that all occurred and the deliberation is more or less done, I'm going to need a sense of the board, a consensus amongst the board, whether the board is prepared to approve the project, approve the project with conditions, or deny the project. Those are the only three options that boards have. And I can't remember the first time, the last time the first of those options was, was seized upon a straight up approval with no conditions. So presumably you are either going to approve the project with conditions or you're going to deny the project. And once you give me that sense, well, if the answer is that you intend to deny the project, um, I will ask for a, a vote to instruct me to draft a denial I will take my notes from these proceedings and I will craft a denial for your consideration at a future meeting. If the sense I get from the board is that you're prepared to approve it with, with conditions, well, then there's another step and that is discussing what those conditions might be. And so we would continue the discussion then about those potential conditions. But once again, once that discussion is complete, I would ask for a vote of the board to instruct me to draft an approval with conditions. And I would bring that to you at the subsequent meeting for you to review. So this is just a continuation of the deliberation process, continuing the three with the three criteria you haven't touched upon yet, at least not in deliberations, and then bringing it back around to a sense, a consensus amongst the, the five voting board members as to whether the requisite vote, the, the supermajority vote is there to grant the special permit. And if it's there, then I, I, we be talking about conditions and an approval. If it's not there, then we, we, we talk about a denial. Okay, I, I hope that cleared it up for everybody a little bit. Any questions on that? If we if we have, um, I'll let Jen, Jen has a question. Yes, so a motion was made, it was seconded and don't they need to vote, everybody vote in order to do what Adam Sokolowski has motion, no? Well, according to um, Mr. Costa, we don't have to because we've already discussed this, so we just move on. I guess that's what he said. Adam okay. has to withdraw his motion. I, I'll withdraw the motion, Adam, okay. for the minutes. Okay. Reflect to withdraw the motion, and 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 um, and as far as deliberation, we'll keep going. But the three one uh, three that we went over last time, um, you know, with conditions, you know, uh, I think um, meet the criteria. So okay. do you want to start on number four, Mr. Chair, or do you want to poll the rest of the members? If that's what people I, apparently need to hear. Like I, don't, to I don't think a Chair. member has to say, but they may be undecided. Okay. I'd like John? to, move. yes, I, I would move that we, uh, that we move directly to the criteria 5325 impacts on natural environment in light of the recent DEP uh, decision and the impact that has on this project to okay, discuss you, that before we discuss the other criteria. Oh, so you want to go with that one first and skip uh, 24 and 26? Yeah, discuss, discuss, skip neighbor, uh, put, discuss that first before we discuss neighborhood character and uh, the potential fiscal impact. Anybody have a problem with that? Mr. Chairman? Yes. So I, I certainly am not going to run your meeting for you, and I have no problem with the order in which you consider the criteria. Um, in, in light of uh, what Mr. Staberski just said in terms of prefacing his remarks and why he wishes to take the items out of order, I just want to state for the record, my role, of course, as counsel is to, to ensure that the process is being uh, carried out uh, in accordance with the bylaw and to protect your interests in the event that there are challenges, what, regardless of what the outcome of your proceedings are. Um, I have a concern 
about any substantive consideration of what Mr. Staberski referred to as the recent DEP decision or letter or whatever, whatever it was that he referred to it as. That letter was received following the close of the public hearing. And so I just want to remind board members that for purposes of your consideration tonight and the deliberate process where the hearing closed three weeks ago, four weeks ago, any information that you may have that, that may have come to light or that may have come to your attention as members of residents of the community and, and citizens and um, since the close of the public hearing is not a proper consideration for better or for worse. And I'm, I'm simply reciting the law. I'm not trying to tie your hands here, but is not proper consideration. And if you choose to rely upon new information, I fear that that jeopardizes the potential, the potential outcome. So I just offer that warning in terms of how far afield you go with information that has become known through whatever channels after the close of the public hearing. Mr. Costa, may I ask you a question? Uh, Mr. Chair, may I ask? Uh, yes, yes, you may. Uh, yes, you may, John. <laughs> and are at this juncture of our proceedings, are we able to reopen the public hearing and accept new information that has arisen since the close of the public hearing uh, as a board? Can we make that vote? And would that vote be legal and appropriate? Uh, so, so through you, Mr. Chair, um, as you might suspect, I, I uh, anticipated that question. It's a question that I've uh, discussed with the chairman in advance of tonight's meeting, thinking that it might arise. So uh, there's, not a, there's not a simple yes or no answer to that question. It's somewhat more complicated than that. Um, I had occasion, because I'm, I'm aware of this issue of reopening public hearings as a matter of parliamentary procedure. It's occurred before in other proceedings in which I've been involved. But I've never had it happen quite under these circumstances. So I, I did a bit of research to see you know, what the case law provides and see if there was any guidance. And not surprisingly, there was little to no guidance in, in case law. There aren't many cases that make it to the appellate courts or for that matter, to the, to the trial courts involving reopening of hearings. It's a procedural issue that tends to be resolved locally. And so the, the guidance that exists is more general guidance that speaks to the, the deference to which board uh, decision making is entitled and board uh, board determination of pr proper procedures. So what I can say is this, um, in my opinion, there is nothing that would prevent the board if it were the will of the board, it would need to be action by the board, meaning a majority of the board acting. Um, there is nothing that would prevent you from reopening a public hearing. Uh, the case law is uh, fairly clear, I think, that deference is due to that sort of decision making by boards. And in fact, the, the rare instances um, where, where this issue of reopening a hearing has come before the courts, typically in, in dicta, meaning in, in passing, um, a, a court will reference it, have been unusual circumstances where let's say a decision has already issued, but new information comes to light and the board attempts to reopen a public hearing on a topic. That's not what this is. This is the hearing closed, deliberations begun, but a potential desire to take into the record uh, new or different information that didn't exist just a few weeks ago. So from my perspective, if that was the will of the board, that would be a supportable decision. I will tell you that reopening the public hearing carries with it all the same procedural requirements that the initial opening of the public hearing carried with it. So that would mean notice, republication, uh, notice meaning meaning notice to, to parties and in interest by mail in the usual manner. Um, the applicant could volunteer to pay the cost of that re-noticing and re-advertising. The applicant could refuse if the applicant is objecting to the reopening of the public hearing. And therefore, if the board were to opt to reopen, it would need to foot that bill itself. Um, but from my perspective, there's nothing that prohibits it. Um, I will tell you, because this is not new information relating to the substance of the case that's before you, I've had occasion to speak to Attorney Donahue as counsel for the applicant. Um, I don't think I'm misrepresenting his statements to me, and um, I know he's, he's present tonight, um, but he uh, indicated to me when we spoke at the end of last week that um, he, he would not acquiesce to a reopening of the public hearing. He didn't think it was appropriate. Um, I told him that if this issue arose, that I would recommend to the chair that um, the chair allowed him to be heard on that issue before the board proceeded so far as to vote to reopen or not the public hearing, because I think that's appropriate given this is a procedural matter. But my opinion, again, is that there's nothing that prohibits it. It's a matter for the discretion of the board, whether the board believes that it needs to reopen the public hearing to, to uh, gain uh, new or additional information. 
uh, Mr. Chair. Um, could you hang on, John? I, I think Adam has a comment, but you can go after him. Go uh, Adam, please. Uh, Mr. Chair, if I may add, uh, ask Mr. Costa a question. Um, now, unfortunately, because, or, or fortunately, either way, there's other boards that are involved in every process that this comes before the zoning board, including site plan review and conservation and those matters. So I'm just trying to speak generally here because uh, it's a general question uh, that that is, um, if we were to approve a plan um, and then because of whatever reason, um, the applicant, because of another board's ruling has to make changes to a plan, like move a driveway or turn, a, move the positioning of a building on a piece of property to, um, better regulate stormwater. Does that applicant then have to return to the zoning board because the process or the plan presenting to us is been changed. What level of significant change um, requires that? Um, and just because uh, an issue could arise with another board, it doesn't necessarily directly affect our opinion. Um, and, and I and I believe you did mention that you're or, or last time you're, you're limited on your time tonight, Mr. Costa. I, I, I have to step away briefly at seven o'clock. I have an unexpected uh, brief commitment, but I'll be back on. So I've, I've got uh, several several more minutes here. So uh, no, okay. no questions. <laughs> um, but, but would you like me to respond to your question? If the chairman would like that, yes, please. Yes, please. So, so through you, Mr. Chair. Um, so uh, the, the answer is generally yes. Um, that if, uh, as you said, and I've indicated this in, in previous appearances before the board, um, Significant projects often require permitting from multiple permitting authorities. Uh, this Dollar General proposal or, or, or uh, a commercial building proposal is, a, is an example of that. It requires a special permit from the Zoning Board of Appeals. It also requires site plan review or site plan approval and a stormwater permit from the Planning Board. And it requires potentially certain uh, approvals or endorsements from the Conservation Commission. Um, it's an applicant's choice how to sequence those approvals. Some applicants choose to pursue all of them simultaneously to ensure consistency. Others choose to pursue one or another in advance to get a sense as to whether there is support for the project, whether it has preliminary permits before pursuing some later permits. The latter approach, the, the, the piggybacking or sequencing of permits and approvals as opposed to simultaneous pursuit is a riskier proposition because when you receive one approval, if later approvals require changes to the project plans, most boards and most council, like myself, representing boards and drafting decisions on behalf of boards, is going to condition the, 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 the approval on, and this is the terminology I use in my decisions, substantial conformance with the plans of record. So when you approve a project, you're not just approving an X thousand square foot commercial building in a vacuum on a site you're approving it pursuant to the plans that were presented to you and all the supporting information behind those plans. And if aspects of those plans change, I would say anything that is material. So relocation of driveway, a relocation of stormwater management structures, a, a, a resizing of the building you know, by more than a couple square feet, anything of that sort would require an amendment of the approval. There's no shortcut to uh, obtain approval of minor amendments through that sort of a process under chapter 40A. So any amendment to the special permit would require an amendment application be made to the ZBA and a new public hearing with renewed notice to parties and interests, renewed publication and a new review by the board. That review would be limited to the changes. It wouldn't be a whole review of the project again, but it would be a review of whatever has changed and the board would have the discretion to approve or deny the change. Uh, I think John, you had a question I'll, I'll, I'll defer to Adam and let him. All right, follow. thank you. Thank you, John. All right, Adam here again for the minutes. Uh, all right, based on what Mr. Costa said, um, then I would be against reopening the public hearing because if another board makes a determination um, based on what Mr. Staberski brought up or another state agency or whether it's Mass DOT, DEP or anybody, if they make the applicant make changes, then they're going to have to come back to us. They're going to have to do the posting, pay for it, 
and, and all that. I think we should, and we do this for every applicant, you know, we're, and when we get through with deliberations, we're going to vote, we give them the opportunity to withdraw, like we do to everybody, and see what they want to do. But I don't think we, uh, we need to open uh, to, to go back a step, um, you know, you know, move forward with the plans that we have in front of us. And if they have to change it because of someone else, then that's going to be on them to, to repost and et cetera, et cetera. Okay, John. So I'm going to formalize this and, and, and so we can have a dis discussion on it. Now, you know, I'm going to with, there was no vote on my motion to take up uh, the matter of uh, environment uh, before uh, we entered into this discussion. So I'll withdraw that motion for the record, but I would like to make uh, another motion that, that we reopen the public hearing to accept evidence solely on section uh, 5325 impacts on the natural environment. And, and let me tell you why I've had, and, and I know this is not, and I, and I want to preface this for Mr. Donahue's edification is, is I'm not saying this in reference to deliberations, but um, I've reviewed the DEP decision and uh, it appears from my reading of that DEP decision that some of the engineering conclusions and analysis that were put forward uh, by Mr. Donahue's client uh, has not withstood the scrutiny of the DEP and is not consider the answers aren't the same basically that there was wetlands or no wetlands and and there have been allegations that uh, the stormwater management was based on faulty uh, a faulty premise of uh, uh, of the soil uh, components uh, <clears throat> I think it's incumbent upon us as a board to have all the information before we make a decision and not defer or delegate to other boards in, in this town. Uh, we have a different duty. We have a different duty than the Conservation Commission. Our duty is to weigh the, the detriments versus the benefits. And if we don't know what those detriments are, we can't make a fair decision. Um, and in this decision uh, of, of the Department of Environmental Protection is significant, very significant. My uh, general understanding of the uh, of of those of the conservation commission rules say that if you can't you can't build in a buffer zone if you have another access way that means everything changes you know where the building's going to be where the driveway's going to be traffic everything and 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 it doesn't make sense for us to go forward until we have a good handle on that so I'm going to make the motion that we uh, that we reopen the public hearing. Uh, I, and uh, give Mr. Donahue a chance to, to talk. Uh, and, uh, and I hope I get a second so we can have a discussion on this. Thank you, John. Um, we wanna move to a second or we wanna give Mr. Donahue a chance to speak. Let's see a kind of a show ahead, hands. Uh, I'm just clarifying, Mr. Chair, that you've yeah. uh, excluded me from uh, participating in this type of action. Um, I, didn't, I, I didn't preclude you from asking questions. I precluded no, but, you but, from voting. Right. So I, I can't second the motion. Is that no. correct? Okay. No, no, you can't. Thank Do you. I have a second? Mr. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chairman, um, before we can, before we could have any discussion by attorney Donahue, it would need a second. Okay. Okay. Well, we didn't it's vote a, on that. It's yet. a motion it's, and a second before it, uh, you can have a discussion of the motion. And I didn't make the second, I just want to point that okay. out. Okay, so we do not have a second. We do not have a second on John's motion. Okay, do I have another motion? I'll, I'll move that we discuss uh, 5325 impacts on natural environment uh, prior to the other criteria that we haven't addressed yet. Okay, we have um, Attorney Costa, you're leaving in what, about 10, five minutes? Not until seven o'clock, Mr. Chairman. And I, I expect I'll be gone for 15, maybe 20 minutes, and then I'll be back on. So you can you can proceed to deliberate. Oh, I, oh I'm sorry. I, I didn't see the clock. Okay. That's okay. We've got time. I'm and, sorry. And Jennifer we can keep Jennifer's going. present as well, so she can assist with the, with the, the note taking. So please proceed. 
Mr. Chair. Uh, who we got? Bernie. Alex. Yeah, um, I just have a point of order. Um, I, I think I, I'm going back a little too far, but um, I was just wondering, do we need to read the uh, public, well, it's not public hearing, but a, a hearing notice into the record? Um, I, I know it's sort of late for that, but um, I don't know if that's something I don't think it's too to late, but the problem I have is I don't have one. Okay. I feel I feel inadequate. I don't have one with I me. I don't know if that's necessary because we've sort of started. Uh, um, does anyone have one? Mr. Chairman, the hearing is closed. Okay. There, there's no there's no need to read the continued okay. public hearing notice. T typically, you'd simply announce the item on the agenda. You would say the next item is continued deliberations on the Dollar General project, and then you just continue discussion, discussing. Okay. You can say that for the record now, although anybody that's been watching, I think, has probably been following along. <laughs> okay, so oh, I, don't, okay. I don't need... Okay, all right. No, thank you. All right. Good Mr. point. Chairman. Okay, we're on to, we're on to 5324, Neighborhood Mr. Characteristics Chairman. and Social Structures. Um, comment. Uh, Mr. Uh, I, I yes, Mrs. Tversky. I thought I made a motion for uh, the that we uh, move to impacts on the natural environment before we do the neighborhood characteristics, and I don't think it was seconded, but uh, but I don't think uh, there was a, a ruling on it. Yeah, I'm sorry, there was no second. Do we have a second? <laughs> have a second on that? Well, we don't have a second, so I guess we're going to go back to our regular format. No comments. Uh, my notes are prepared in the order. Okay. As written. Okay, so we're going to continue then. So we don't have a second. We're going to continue. Fifty-three twenty-four. Neighborhood characteristics and social structures. Comments. Board members. Comments. I'm free. To, I'm happy to comment on that. Uh, I think this uh, is John John Stabersky. I think this is probably the most important criteria that we have to look at. And if I were to suggest a weighting to my fellow board members that this should be weighted very heavily uh, beyond all of the other criteria and maybe as much as 50% of, of the, our entire judgment. My personally, I would weight that almost 50%. And, and I uh, firmly believe that the benefits of this project uh, do not outweigh, uh, the, the detriments do not outweigh the benefits. <laughs> of the neighborhood characteristic character. I mean, if you look around that area, but for the Yankee Candle facility, most of them are older New England or New England type buildings, mom and pop type businesses. There is a very thriving and significant residential community uh, abutting it. Um, it is not a place where we should exceed what is our what is what the voters of Deerfield uh, gave for our um, master plan and and what should be the uh, size of a facility, uh, a commercial facility, a retail facility in town? And there's a very good reason for that. It's because uh, our residents and our master planning process determined that we did not want large retail or commercial facilities without the important criteria being met. And that is, uh, in this instance, neighborhood character, neighborhood character and social structure. I mean, it's, we, we have a little rock and fossil shop that's been there for years that's gonna get swallowed up. Um, it, it, it's gonna dwarf the size of the condos. And what I'm most concerned about is that it, it's gonna set a precedent for other large retail, commercial, facilities to locate on, on Route 5 and 10 exactly what um, what our planning process some years ago had decided we did not want in town. Um, if this board votes to approve this, it is really usurping uh, the will of the town meeting, the will of the voters, and our planning process because this is the exact thing that, that our zoning bylaws were designed to not have in this town. 
Um, I think it's going to it's going to decrease the assessed values of of the condominiums, and maybe even the other buildings in that vicinity. And, and for those reasons, um, I think this is a very serious detriment, and the benefits of the project, which are some, do not outweigh those detriments. Okay. Other comments. No other comments. Hang on a second, Bernie. I got to get my video back. I'm just trying to have okay. some. <coughs> Unless someone else wants to go. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Decker. That entire strip, starting basically in Northampton, with the exception of a few minor spaces all the way through to Greenfield, is highly commercial. And it's always been thought of as a corridor of commercial properties, okay? And uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, it, that property is, is fine for the development as proposed. Uh, by rights, there are two lots there and you could put two separate buildings on those lots, less than 4,000 square footage wise, 4,000 or less on each one. That would be 8,000 square feet of buildings, plus driveways, et cetera, et cetera. The 9,000 square foot building is probably more appropriate to a orderly development of that property. So that's all I got to say. Okay. All right, uh, Adam Sekolowski. Yep. I basically, um, when you look at the amount of square feet that this proposal is covering on the lot size based on a number of factors, including what could go there, if this, if a retail location wasn't built, I feel the impact is less detrimental. I think that um, as far as community character, based on the first drawings and the last drawings, the applicant has stepped up to the plate to make the building look uh, much better than their original design, much better than the the crappy looking store they have in Berniston. Um, and they've also, uh, you know, a condition, I believe we would have to work on, on signage um, if the board were to propose it as far as my concerns where I don't like the bright yellow signs, but if you start, um, you know, at Magic Wings, their building's much bigger than this. You go, go down to uh, the auto body shop, the auctioneer building, I just, um, Look, that had that one. That one's 32,000 square feet for the auctioneer. This board approved the um, storage place. There's three buildings there. They covered almost the entire lot. Um, they had to use some non porous stuff, but there's no green space there whatsoever. Um, and then you have the gables, the mess of the um, train folks they, they they because they're federal somehow they're exempt from us which is terrible that place looks like a disaster um and you have a residence then you have um multiple commercial buildings owned by mr camosa uh some of them are are larger than or uh put together closer and cover more lot space there than this project would and then you have um a farm stand that's very well acquainted, but that's basically built on the brook there uh, when that expanded. Um, but it looks great. Um, it is basically on the water, but it does look great. Uh, look great. Um, <clears throat> and then you have another couple residents, the fossil place that used to be a farm stand that was turned into a location without coming in for these boards, without getting parking approved, just, just kind of got slid right in there. Um, and you have this property, and then you look further down the commercial corridor in the district, you have Yankee Candles Giant Warehouses, you have Channing Beat Company, the Vet Hospital now, although much more setback, is probably busier from, from what I've been hearing than any retail location would be. People are, you know, the heartbreaking stories of people sitting in their cars for, for hours waiting for, for care recently, and um, and then you have uh, you know, the fire station. So you look back at that property and you do have to consider the condos behind it, their, their uh, pitch roof, their residential, their, um, their view, but the applicant does have uh, mitigation in place that um, other by right uh, people 
may not have, uh, buy right builders may not have. So that's, you know, really the crux of this board and this bylaw is to make sure that the applicant comes to us and meets the requirements. Um, you know, if at the lower square footage, you could put up an ugly building, you would have to put up uh, you could put up whatever you wanted as long as it met the building code. It wouldn't have to be barn red. It wouldn't have to meet those criteria. So, you know, my opinion on on why the um, why the special permits required, and then you go down to Cumberland Farms, and that building um, is also uh, much larger, approved by this board at a much busier intersection with may, way more crashes. So then I take in. Uh, those all those projects uh, some recently the self-storage and the Cumberland Farms approved by this board and uh, I take a hard look at it and and I although there's there's strong public opposition to this project I think about the next step I think about is any reasonable justice going to look at that corridor and say that this doesn't fit this, this doesn't fit. And I don't think that there's a reasonable justice that would think that way. And you have to, I have to remove myself from the emotion because there's a lot of friends and neighbors and very good people in this community that are against the project. And I understand their frustration, but I also understand the long-term goals uh, and what could be on that property if this doesn't. And this still may, may not be there. Um, but I think that the design from the from the renderings given, we're at a place that this building would fit to me, this, the applicant has met the requirement and in the proposal. Okay, th thank you, uh, Adam. Uh, anyone else for comments? <laughs> Alex? Um, I probably should have went before Adam because I don't, I don't think I can follow up with anything as eloquent as that. Um, I tend to agree. I think um, the applicant has done a pretty decent job in um, conforming to some of the wishes that we've expressed. And again, we're not the planning board, so we can't shape the building too, too much. Um, but uh, it, it could have been something worse. Um, and another thing is, um, you know, I understand the opposition to the project. Um, I guess my only counter to that is that, um, you know, if, if people aren't happy with the zoning bylaws, we need to change them. Um, uh, I think, speaking for myself, I would be happy to have a giant forum where we get the whole town involved, um, you know, and try to get as many people to participate as possible and come up with something that we can all agree on to some degree or another, um, even if it's a, uh, you know, we have to uh, concede things here and there, but um, I, I think if there's just such a strong sentiment, then we need to change the bylaws. And um, I think with what we have, I think the project fits in, um, at least in terms of the neighborhood character. Um, I guess I could speak more broadly about all of the characteristics, but I won't do that because I we'll wait till they get to the next one or whatever. But um, yeah, I think Adam's right. Um, I think uh, what he said is well done. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you, Alex. Um, Mr. Decker, comment? Mr. Decker's not here. Mr. Decker? Okay, we lost. Um, I, I'd like the record to reflect that Mr. Decker is not present during the deliberations. Okay. He, I believe he said his piece before I, before I went, Adam speaking. Yeah, I just like the record reflect that he's not part of the del these <coughs> deliberations. Uh, Mr. Sadowski, could I, um, uh, uh, may I respond to some of my, uh, my uh, ZBA members comments? Okay, the only thing is we don't have our council present and I don't, I'm not really feeling comfortable with not council not being here. I think I think council needs to be present when we make our statements. Uh, I, 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 you know, uh, I don't agree. All point. right, Mr. S Mr. Sukolowski. Well, we've been going for an hour. Do you want to do a ten-minute break? Maybe Mr. Yeah, Decker has to use the bathroom. John, I'm not comfortable with him not being here. We are we're we're paying for him to be here. 
to guide us in the right direction. This is a complex situation. And I'm not gonna be comfortable without him being here. I, I, I'm gonna be straightforward. Okay, let's take a recess. Bernie? Right. Yes. So Adam was just talking about taking a recess. Maybe Bob had to go to the men's room. That's possible. Right, so why don't we take a 10 minute if that's good with you? Okay, he said 15 minutes, he'll be okay. back. Whatever, whatever you'd like. Okay, let's take a 15 minute recess, please. Hey, Bernie, it's 718. Okay, um, we have a little bit of a problem here. Um, I see that Adam, our attorney is not here. He said he'll be back. Okay, the issue we have is he is uh, recording the uh, comments by the board members to draw up our conditions. Yep. <laughs> and because of that, it's important that he be here when our comments are made. So um, like, like he said, I can take notes. This is also being recorded so he okay. can listen to it after, but it's up to you. Um, how does the rest of the board feel on this? Alex? Uh, it's all right. We can, I mean, uh, I think deliberation is fine. I don't, okay. um, yeah. Uh, Adam? Uh, I'm fine with moving on to the next criteria. Okay. Well, and I, you know, we're waiting for Mr. Decker. Mr. Decker, I you fine I'm moving fine. on? Yeah, I had a problem with my machine before I could hear you, but I couldn't respond to you. Oh. Okay, and and John, I assume you're all set to go. Uh, I was uh, in the midst of making a response to my fellow board members' statements, and okay, uh, you, you can continue then. I you, you you said that you needed to have the attorney there, but yeah. uh, Bernie, I, uh, thank you. I'm going to direct one comment to you though. Um, in some of the statements, you're when you say you're talking about conditions, that's presupposing this passes. Uh, we haven't taken any votes or rulings on that. Uh, I'm, so, I'm sorry, I don't mean con conditions. What I meant is he's he's look he's looking at what we're saying, and that's what I meant by it. Okay. I don't think this can. I didn't mean to say conditions. I meant that he was going to record our comments. Okay. And if we either approve it or disapprove it, that's what he's going to base his. Um, I don't know what your applicant the the, the the on the application Decision. denial or whatever. Understood. Okay, I'm I'm sorry if I misspoke. Sure that 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 was you know a correct impression. Okay. Um, so I want to direct this both to, to Adam and Alex uh, to two comments that you made, and, and both of you have said this repeatedly over the course of of these hearings is that this is better than what else could go there, whether it's two buildings on two lots, whether it's a storage facility, whatever it is. And, and that is an improper criteria with which to consider this. We are not to consider what would, could go there and is this gonna be better? Our zoning bylaws say we are supposed to decide whether the benefits outweigh the detriments based upon the six criteria, not the alternatives. We are not allowed to look at the alternatives. And for you all to both of you to be basing your opinions or decisions on that, I think is, is, is you're, you're putting a, a condition or a, uh, or a criteria that is not in our bylaws. Um, we are not supposed to think about what else could go there. Um, uh, for all we know, it could be, you know, something that uh, very incredibly offensive, a sewage treatment plant or something like that. But we can't, we can't think that way. We have to look as to whether the benefits of this project outweigh the detriments that the project brings to this site. Um, and I'd really ask you, and I know I can tell the way how you all are, are, are thinking and leaning, but I'd ask you to, to reevaluate your decisions, opinions, in light of the fact that you're not supposed to think about what else could go there? Um, it's it's what we have before us. Do the benefits outweigh the detriments with respect to the six criteria uh, we are uh, duty bound to consider? So I said that, uh, and I and I'd hope you guys would think about that. Adam Sekolowski, for the record, thanks for thanks for that, John. I I appreciate the uh, the the lecture, and um, 
I'm ready to, to move, move forward with this. Uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that we're supposed to and not supposed to think about in your opinion. And in our opinion, I'll take my legal opinion from Mr. Costa. And, and, and that's why I reach out for him. Um, and uh, that's why I, I appreciate his attendance tonight. Um, so I, I do appreciate that. And I try to think globally um, on, on all these matters, not just, uh, not just short-sighted. Okay, thank you, Adam. Alex, you have a comment? You want something, something, <coughs> something you want to say? Um, I suppose. Um, I hear what you're saying, John. Um, I think you're partially right. Um, but uh, if you want to hear it from me, I, I don't think that the detriments, um, I think I'm saying that right. I, I think the, uh, no, let me, let me say that back. Uh, I think the benefits um, outweigh the detriments of this particular project, if to speak generally, in my opinion. Okay, thank you, Alex. Uh, Mr. Decker, comment? I think that the benefits outweigh the detriments. Okay, uh, Mr. Potter, any comments, Mr. Potter? Okay, thank you. Um, I, I know these are difficult decisions because we've got residential areas around them. And I think it was poorly planned. They put them in a position where they put um, residents in this zoning area, it's zoned for commercial and it's made it difficult. And uh, I agree that the zoning laws need to be reviewed because we have lots of gaps and it leaves us with uh, decisions to make <coughs> and it makes it tough. This makes it tough, there's no question about it, but it's zoned for what it's zoned for. Um, the neighborhood characteristics, well, if you look at that street, there's a lot of different, it's, a, it's, it's very diversified. All the whole road is very diversified. Um, and that makes it uh, neighborhood characteristics well. It, it fits the neighborhood characteristics because it's, it's diversity. Um, and the social structure, well, that to me is a wash, but I think that it fits, <laughs> it fits the neighborhood. And, and I think it's unfortunate that the neighborhood is upset about it. I can understand their feelings. I've been there, I've done that, but I don't see that we can not agree that it, it fits the neighborhood in its structure. Um, I can't hang my head on any reason why it wouldn't. Um, that's my comment, anyone else? Okay. <coughs> okay, we go to impact in natural environment, environment 53, 20, uh, please excuse my <coughs> my throat and my sinuses. 5325. I'm going to have to limit my speaking for a while. Maybe that's good. Okay, 5325. Do we <coughs> have anyone that wants to address that? John? Well, you know, I would prefer Adam to be here before okay. I address that because... Uh, because I know we are uh, going to be treading on, on on difficult ground with having with having to rely on what is improper information to 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 render a a, a judgment as to whether the benefits equal the detriments. Um, but we do have so um, maybe we maybe we um, defer this one till Adam uh, is available. <laughs> Does that, does that make sense to? Uh, I think it makes sense to everybody. I don't have a problem with that. Yep. I see shaking Sounds your good. head. So uh, let's go to 5326 and go back to 5325 when, when Adam is here. Any objections to that? Okay. All right. 5325 potential, potential financial impact, including impact on town services, tax base, and employment. Comments? Well, I would say that, may I address the board? Yes, yes, John. You know, in general, I think it's a wash, but I think it's, uh, uh, you know, uh, a shame that we had not 
uh, that that this board did not uh, vote to allow the uh, consultant from from uh, Huntley to uh, to advise us on this, because I although I think the tax base and the financial impact is is really tough for us to be able to evaluate, because although this business will bring in tax revenue, if the assessments and we don't know this, but if the assessments to uh, the surrounding uh, buildings uh, and residents and commercial establishments go down because of the existence of this, um, then we'd have maybe a net loss. And, uh, and that's why I was looking for, you know, having uh, some, some additional expertise in trying to decide this. So, you know, it, we're gonna be asked to decide this on what I consider incomplete information um, so, uh, you know, I, I can't say yeah, the benefits equal the detriments because um, my fellow board members did not want to engage in consulting people to, to help advise us on it. It's beyond my, my expertise. Okay, other comments? Adam, are you there? Yeah, I, I'm here, Bernie. The technology just takes a second. Okay. Um, well, um, you know, I think that the taxation benefits the um, town greatly. It's a it's a low impact on services. Um, you know, you look at uh, they're not sending anybody to school. They're not um, you know have to be you know code compliant with fire and safety and and such. So you you would think that it would be you know a limiting. Um, our most cost effective service that we provide or not cost effective, but most costly services is education of children about $20,000 per student per, per head. So, you know, you keep that in mind and then there's sales tax on items um, that, that come in. So I think it's a, it's a positive um, as far, as far as um, generating revenue for the community and economics and it also is a, a benefit for people to uh to purchase things you know close by um, i know granted when they first gave their presentation they're, they're looking at commuter traffic um, trips uh, and such when you know, get into those traffic studies um you know it may have uh an economic benefit uh, uh on people that that use it uh, obviously they're a pro, uh, for-profit uh type type establishment, but, um, you know. Okay, other comments, Alex, comment? Um, I, I think it's kind of a, I don't wanna say it's a wash, but it's maybe a neutral. Um, I, I do think that um, there is gonna be some increase in tax revenue, uh, sales tax and property tax. Um, I think uh, just looking forward, I think that's, going to be important to put less pressure on, you know, uh, homeowners who are uh, the majority of uh, um, hold up the tax base. Um, so I think that's a step in the right direction. Um, I, I don't think it's a giant benefit, but um, it's sort of, I, I guess, slightly beneficial. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Decker, comments? Is he working? Is it working? Mr. Decker. Um, it's a great benefit. Oh, here, go ahead, Mr. Decker. It's a great benefit. People will have the ability to buy things that they can't typically buy within the confines of the town of Deerfield. And I think it'd be a public service. Okay, Mr. Potter, comments? None? Okay. Um, I, I think I can make a short comment on this. Um, I think the financial impact is, is going to be limited for services with a benefit of increased taxes, um, tax base. But I've also taken a, a, a long look since um, being elderly. Unfortunately, I'm getting older. Um, of 
being able to purchase things and not have to travel through a largely congested area. But another area that is really concerning me now is this COVID thing. Um, I, I get worried about going places. And I think if we have a, a place that provides services we can get in town, that it's closer, it's gonna offer us some protection. We don't know how long this is gonna last. And, I, and I, I, it's, it's getting on my nerves, very honestly. And I don't think maybe I'm the only one, but it, everything you do has been based around this COVID and the ability for people <coughs> to buy things closer and not have to travel, um, I, I think is a real benefit to the community, especially for the elderly people, which I consider myself to be one. Luckily, I'm old enough to, 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 to get to my age. Um, so I, I look at the elderly people having a place that they can purchase things um, and not have to travel. And, and uh, I know we're not supposed to look at that, but it, it, it's going to provide things that the town is going to need that we've missed since uh, we've had a change in the past 50 or 60 years. Those, uh, those small five grocery stores we had are gone. Um, so the in hardware store, yes, they're open part of the time. So I think it, it, it really is a benefit to the town as far as I'm concerned. Okay, anyone else a response to what I said? Okay. Well, I could, uh, I'd like to respond. Yeah. I, I, I think although there will be uh, some, I mean, first of all, I think the comments with respect to whether it's better in terms of products uh, and availability for senior citizens and whatnot really does not fit within this subsection uh, for analysis. This is the, it really potential fiscal impact, including impact on town services, tax base and employment. Not on. I think it's. I think they talk about town services, not the services that 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 we have. Um, so um, so I think if you're looking at this criteria, it's really what is how is it an impact our municipality employment tax base and services. So I think it really should be limited to to, to that for for this criteria, not kind of mixing uh, criteria. Okay. Any other comments? Mr. Costa, you're back. Thank you for coming back. I am. Okay, we held up on um, 5325 because John had some issues that he wanted to talk about specifically that would 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 uh, you could address. Sure. So we're going back to uh, neighborhood care. No, I'm sorry, impacts on natural environment 53. 25 open discussion so mr costa uh, i've read that i've read the dep opinion and am i supposed to erase that out of my mind and not consider that as we um as we think about the impacts on natural environment um how, how does one comport um you know an opinion like that when it when it pertains to this project and and uh where the the hearing was not open to receive that information so through you uh mr chair so um that's that's a difficult question to answer and i can i can't i can't uh unfortunately don't have to put myself in your shoes or the shoes of your your fellow board members but i can certainly appreciate the sentiment that uh, things have become known to you since the close of the public hearing. And so I think the question you're asking is how do you, how do you sort of, how do you unsee something that you've seen? How do, how do you forget something that you now know? Um, and so this sort of ties back into the conversation we had before about the, the public hearing, the closure of the public hearing, the potential reopening of the public hearing. Uh, that's a decision that only you as a board can make. And that decision, I think, has been made unless it's going to be reconsidered. And so if the decision has been made by the board not to reopen the public hearing, then you're limited to considering the information that was part of the record at the time that the hearing closed. And for better or for worse, like it or not, I mean, that's simply the law. And the, the, only, the only analogy I can draw as a lawyer is sort of thinking about, and you can probably appreciate this, a circumstance in the courtroom where a statement is made and there's an immediate you know, motion to uh, 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 move to strike and the, the judge strikes it from the record, it's been said, how do, you, how do you unhear it? Well, 
you know, judges are sort of taught to do that. They, they know what can be considered and what can't be. If something shouldn't have come in, it's not part of the record. It's, it can't influence the, out, the ultimate decision. Um, I realized that for the average person, that's a difficult thing to do. And again, I can't vote for you. I can't, uh, I can't dictate what, you're, what you and your heart of hearts are considering or not. I can simply tell you that you know, the way the process and the procedure works and the material upon which your decision is meant to be based is what came in when the public hearing was open. And if there were to be an ensuing appeal, the, mat the, the matters that would be before the board or the matters that the court rather are the matters that were properly before the board at the time that the board closed the public hearing. And for better or for worse, like it or not, and I'm not saying that I necessarily like it, I think the answer is, well, if the information that came in uh, from DEP results in certain project changes, um, that that will result in, in project modifications and that would have to come back before you before the project could proceed. But again, I, 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 can't, I can't sit here and tell you that you know, you're, you're, you're obligated to put out of your head the things you've heard. I can only tell you that you're not supposed to use that as a basis for your decision making. And I don't think that a court would support you using that as a basis for your decision making. Um, so uh, for, as a matter of record, uh, at the end, just before our uh, close of our public hearing, or I think this was a very confusing circumstance, Attorney Aleo had uh, sent a letter to, uh, uh, to the chair of this board on the day that we closed the public hearing. Um, we, there was discussion. No one had, I think a few people had seen it. There was an opinion attached to it from an engineer. Um, I did not read it because um, until after the close of the public hearing, um, I don't know if that particular uh, letter is part of the record um, or not. And uh, because there, there are some things in that opinion that, that we can talk about with respect to the environment. Can anybody tell me whether that is part of the record or not? Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Decker. Was that letter before the board the evening we voted to close the hearing? Had it been submitted with the rest of the paperwork for the board that night? Did we have it in our possession? No, we did not. And I, that letter was not sent to me. It was, this is my understanding of how this happened. The letter was sent at the time when the office was closing. They did not get it in a, in a uh, time, timely fashion. So it got there so that no one could handle it and it was not directly sent to me. Um, so it was so sent it to- It wasn't properly before the board. Pardon? Okay. It wasn't, therefore it wasn't properly before the board. No, as far as I know, it wasn't. Um, I, I'm trying to speak for the for the office personnel, but that was the question we had. It did not come directly to me. It came to the office, and I believe the office was closed was closing at that time, so it didn't get processed. Um, and uh, all that's like I can tell you is that's what I was told. Thank you. Uh, may I ask what is the procedure by which something? officially comes into our, our our purview for because i i've received you know a, a plethora of uh of correspondence from citizens and things that have been forwarded to me from the office of uh of the town uh does that count too i mean it wasn't submitted filed at the when we we're at a meeting but it's come in and been been mailed to us is that okay um consider we we have an issue here John, um, Jennifer is not supposed to participate in this meeting. And I am not gonna ask her to participate in this situation because she's supposed to remain neutral. Uh, she's been told not to. Um, so your question, uh, we will, I can't answer the question. I know that if it's presented, uh, you said sent to the chairman. Well, I was the chairman and I never received it. So um, all I can say is that I didn't get it. It wasn't forwarded to me and it was in that office, I believe at the end of the day, that's what I was told. Um, so uh, that's all I can tell you, John. 
I, yeah, so, you know, I want to talk about this issue as to what is a, what is a matter of record um, that we can talk about uh, and consider, but it's kind of like, I don't know exactly what we can consider and what we can't. That letter is apparently, uh, I mean, I don't know if Mr. Costa can, can uh, rent, uh, give us some advice on it, but other things that we've read from other citizens that have been forwarded as comments, is, is that properly before us as well, or is that not before us? Would you like me to address that, Mr. Chair? Yes. So generally the matters that are properly before the board are matters that were in the board's possession at the time that the public hearing was closed. And there, there, uh, without getting into the weeds here, I mean, there, there, there's, there's actual possession, there's constructive possession by virtue of the fact that something, let's say, was submitted to staff that receives documents on behalf of the Zoning Board of Appeals and maybe through some error, copies of that document were not scanned and emailed to all the members. Um, I can tell you that, you know, as of your, the last session of the public hearing you had, as of the close, the time of the close of the public hearing, I had received a copy of that letter. I know that certain staff had received a copy of that letter. I can't speak for each individual board member as to whether any of you had it. Um, also, the added complication, of course, these days with COVID-19 is that submittals are not always being made or done the same way that they were previously because of town hall closures or partial closures or temporary closures, uh, limited staffing, uh, more reliance upon electronic communication. So. I don't know enough about how this document was received by the town, by whom it was received, how it was circulated. If the document was in the actual or even the constructive possession of the board because somebody accepted it on behalf of the board, then I think it's, it's fair game for consideration by the board once you get into deliberations. Um, that's different than something coming in you know, the day after you close the public hearing. That's, or, or in the case of the DEP letters we've been referencing, a couple of weeks after you've closed the public hearing. That information clearly is not before the board where the public hearing has been closed. So I wanna know whether I can talk about this. That's really, you know, I'd say I'm not trying to, trying to cause confusion and make things more complicated than they are, but you know, there were some of the very same issues that were raised in the DEP letter were raised in that correspondence, at least the attached opinion letter from the hydrologist. Um, so I, so I'm at a loss here as to what, what we can, what I can say on this. I don't know. Uh, can I just say it and just, uh, and, and let the chips fall where they may? Or, or what, what's, what's the advice, uh, Attorney Costa? Because I don't think we have a clear, a clear idea what, what I can talk about, at least in terms of that opinion or not. Right. So, I mean, I, I think that the, 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 the advice I'd give would be to, to get a definitive answer as to whether that document was properly before the board or not. I, I mean, I, I can't dictate to you what to discuss or not to discuss. I, I will tell you what I think you probably already know, which is, you know, if you were to rely upon and ultimately the entire board because or, or a, a sufficient number of votes were to rely upon information that should not have been discussed, was not part of the record, and that forms the basis of an approval or a denial, um, then, then that weakens the strength of that approval or denial if there's a subsequent appeal. Um, but I also remind you, as most of you probably know, that it's a de novo appeal on review. And so these sorts of procedural issues tend to not make their way into the courtroom because the court's gonna review the evidence as it, as it exists. It's gonna be de novo. So. Um, but but the, the best advice I can give is to get to the bottom of when it was received. As you were talking there, I was going back through my emails to try and find when I received it and who was on the email chain. But again, I'm not in town hall. Uh, nothing comes through me. I just happened to have been forwarded the document. I don't know where else it went, when it came in, who received it initially, and whether any members of the board got it and when they got it. Okay. I, I, I said, since, since I can't have a clear opinion on this, I, I am, I am, I am, I think I'm going to be compelled not to uh, raise those issues much to my chagrin. I think they should be raised. I think they're very important. Um, 
but I can't say because I know this has been brought up by other uh, by some of the members of the public uh, during this meeting is that there there is a suspicion that that there are wetlands in that area and that the that construction on that site could exacerbate flooding on Bloody Brook. Now I think we all know that Bloody Brook has has a history of flooding. I mean I know Adam's family uh, has a house on on that on that brook. My father owns a house on that brook. I have witnessed it all of my life. That anytime there is a severe flood, you know it's it's difficult. People's people's basements flood. Some people can't get access to their houses. Uh, because their driveways uh, cross over Bloody Brook, um, you know, it comes close to the high school, uh, and anything, anything that would uh, imperil or exacerbate those flooding issues has to be taken very seriously by the sport. I, and, and, I, and this is why, you know, we're kind of operating in a vacuum here. We cannot and should not defer or delegate to the Conservation Commission to, uh, to fully make uh, decisions on this because they have to follow regulatory scheme. Our charge is whether the benefits outweigh the detriments. And we look at the uh, additional flooding or the uh, wetlands issues as, opposed, as to whether the benefits uh, outweigh the detriments. I would say, I would suggest that there is significant environmental implications once again, if we had our own consultant, like I had moved that we uh, we employ, we would have some direction. Uh, unfortunately, we are uh, having to go on our own on our own opinions that are not based in any more fact than of the testimony or the submissions we've heard. Mr. Potter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I have a question for the board to consider. Um, if I may, we have been given 90 days to make this decision, as I understand it. And um, uh, I, I do understand the um, sentiment not to reopen the public hearing. Um, but if we were to postpone and, or let me say, continue the hearing um, based upon, um, well, we've, we've postponed hearings, we've, we've continued hearings under, under many circumstances. But my point is that um, the decision of that, oh, well, I guess I have to withdraw this because I, I, I feel like I'm about to discuss something that's been, been said that we're not entitled to discuss. Um, and so um, I think it's, 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 uh, it's inappropriate in that way. I'm gonna withdraw the comment. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Um, Mr. Sekulowski, any comments? Uh, Mr. Costa, did you have something? If I could, because um, Mr. Chairman, and I don't, I don't mean to interrupt Mr. Sekulowski, but, um, I think that this may be relevant. I said I was searching for some of the email email chain here and Mr. Staberski's question about uh, the letter from attorney Leo. So, and, and, and I wanna give a definitive opinion here because I think that I can, regardless of where the, the cards may fall here. I'm, I'm looking here at what I received and I received a copy of an email from attorney Leo to uh, the address of building assistant, which was uh, the, 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 the BLDGASST at town.deerfield.ma.us. And um, that, that was sent on Thursday, November 12th at three o'clock, 3.05 p.m. Uh, believe that the 12th was the evening when the board last uh, met when you concluded the public hearing and proceeded to commence deliberations. Um, now, certainly I, I spoke before about actual and, and constructive receipt of the document. You know, I, I appreciate that maybe board members uh, had not had an opportunity to read it between 3.05 p.m. and when the public hearing commenced. But I will note that for purposes of submittal of a document to the Zoning Board of Appeals, I'm looking on the Town of Deerfield Zoning Board of Appeals website. And Subra Law, 
administrative assistant is listed as the administrative assistant for the zoning board. And under contact information, it has the building assistant at town.deerfield.ma.us address. So from my perspective, if I were to rely upon the contact information for the ZBA on the website, I send the document to that address. And so from, for in my opinion, that document was constructively received by the board, whether board members had been forwarded it or not prior to the, uh, the closing of the public hearing. Okay, thank you, Mr. Costa, Adam here. Mr. Chair, do you want me to continue? Yeah, go ahead, Mr. Uh, Mr. Sokolowski, go ahead, address it, please. Uh, okay, so on this matter in front of us, this question here um, on the environmental impacts. Uh, first, I, I will thank Mr. Costa for his opinion. And I did review that letter after the fact. It was a different letter from Attorney Leo. But I do always think back to the comments made by the the lawyer during the September meeting that was hired by the um, folks from Dollar General that agreed that it was in fact a developable piece of property. And he, in fact, uh, during that meeting did uh, say that there could be a chain gas station or, or, or a number of different things that could be, could be um, built there. He agreed that it was developable. So I tend to think that we think of um, the responsibility of other boards and state agencies to do their due diligence. And um, I, I definitely think that hopefully within the next 90 days, these other boards planning uh, conservation or wherever this project would be, it would get sorted out. And that, that may be a tactical decision that this board may wanna continue for 30 days or 60 days. I, I, I feel as though <clears throat> confident enough that um, that we could do our own thing as well, but uh, that's up for everybody to decide. And in Bloody Brook, uh, in that area, um, the ground, the soil is is it's Deerfield. It's um, it definitely retains water all the way down the whole five and ten quarter, uh, North Main Street. Um, you know, my house uh, where I live on on Bloody Brook Drive, um, and you know, my sump pump runs. And um, but for us to say that the environmental impacts um, of a developable piece of property deem it non-developable because of a possibility that it may increase flooding is pretty far reaching because we have a stormwater bylaw that requires stormwater management. And um, just because uh, wetland or wetland soils or vegetation or anything uh, on those properties. I mean, you have, you know, the Rivers and Streams Act and Bloody Brook is an intermittent stream. It dries up in the summer. Yeah, and it floods when it rains hard. Um, but you have the Deerfield River and you have multiple developments within uh, the floodplain uh, on the Deerfield River. Um, Deerfield Academy continues to build towards the river over the past 20 years and it's had water all the way out almost out to, to North Main Street or Old Main Street. Um, so, you know, yes, water has has an impact and it doesn't necessarily determine this site or any site to be non-developable. And there's other boards, in my opinion, the Conservation Committee and the Planning Board that are better suited to address issues when it comes to stormwater retention, the possibility of flooding. And if this plan has to be changed, then therefore um, the applicant may have to mitigate it. Or if something major has to be changed, then they may have to come back to us uh, again. So I feel as though the applicant has met the criteria um, and that the building of this uh, proposed, uh, proposed site um, would not have any, uh, will not be detrimental to um, the environment as a commercial piece of property. I mean, and you know, you, you've also put in contacts other things that have been bet, built in town um, that do have great detriments to the, to the um, environment. Uh, solar panel installations up off of Keats Road took down acres and acres and acres of trees. Um, more farmland getting destroyed off of uh, Set Right Road for another uh, acres and acres and acres uh, of development. Um, and those are not zoned commercial. And now we have a commercial piece of property um, 
and, and it's uh, use and there's a lot of green space there. They, they only cover a, a, a not as much of a, of a footprint as um, you could cover on that piece of property. Um, and then, like I said, those stormwater management plans are going to have to be approved by planning. Um, and if there's wetlands uh, edu uh, there, they're going to have to be approved by DEP um, or or the conservation committee and both. And that's for the applicant to work out. So, um, you know, I'm ready to move forward uh, if we, if the board would like to tonight or, you know, possibly delay it to see what comes out in, in the, in the wash, but we're not supposed to really use that information from what Mr. Costa says, if um, we close our public hearing, but I mean, common sense would tell you that, how do you not know what another board vote board votes for so i mean i mean and and personally i think that all this you know the other we shouldn't be all you know at different parts of the process i think things shouldn't really come to us until they've been approved or denied to other bo boards but that's i guess a conversation for another day well may I, may I, Mr. um john hang on a second mr potter you had your hand up first comment mr thank potter you. or not thank you um uh, I guess it's a kind of a question, a comment. Thank you. Um, I, I, uh, I see where Adam is thinking and I, I, I wonder, uh, well, I just wanna say that the, the, we're, we're, it doesn't feel like if we were to um, uh, uh, continue this to another time that we're not relying upon the planning board to make any decision, as far as I understand it, that would um, uh, stop their process. The planning board advises and helps to plan, um, but it seems more relevant that um, a determination, which is a legal obstacle, may be stated. And, um, and, and, and that's not in the planning board's purview, but that is very likely to change the design and change their um, uh, approach to us. So why, when we have so consistently um, advised our own town residents on issues of um, relatively minor importance that they might withdraw their um, appeal and, and bring it in, an, in a more uh, uh, appropriate avenue um, or after a more appropriate process has been played out. Uh, why would this board uh, seek to deny uh, and actually deny the gentleman in the previous meeting from, from old Deerfield to extend his, his non-conforming piece of property just a little bit further on the basis of one uh, concern from a neighboring uh, property owner and yet this board is principled in that decision because of a, a concern of precedence. Uh, and yet in this case, we seem to be referring to um, meeting the criteria, which is not part of this decision. There is no criteria. There is our, um, our decision that they, I mean, I guess I wonder under what criteria would we possibly deny if, uh, if, if there is any meeting of the criteria. So my point really is they will likely be forced to create another application, to redesign. It seems obvious to us all that there is a determination and it will create a legal um, obligation from them, from them to, you know, we know where that driveway has been positioned. They're going to have to recreate. So why wouldn't we um, uh, await that and see what is the best course of action for them to proceed on and um, uh, not grant anything, at the, or possibly grant anything at this time that could be so severely impacted. And then, uh, uh, you know, they have to come back with a brand new design um, and, and start some process all over again. All right, Mr. Staberski. Well, David, David, since, you're, since you brought that up, the reason why is that if we vote to uh, approve it, uh, we cannot rescind a vote afterwards. Uh, and, and it gives them additional leverage with the Conservation Commission or the DEP or anybody else. I mean, they're putting yeah. kind of in a bit of a vice here. And, 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 and particularly since the information is evolving and fluid, you usually make decisions when you have it all laid out on the table and you know the, the benefits and the detriments. In this instance, we 
know that there is a potential detriment that is not fully explored. We don't know the implications of it and, and we're not supposed to think about it, but that is something before us. Uh, I'd like to go back to one thing that really does bespeak to the environment since Mr. Costa has opined if the board is, is inclined to accept Mr. Alio's letter that came in the date we closed our public hearing is, and this is something that is that, that I think is really serious, that their uh, expert has, and, and someone who is eminently qualified, has, has disputed the findings of the Lascotti engineers. And, and it said that they're based on faulty premises, faulty premises of the soil composition, which affects water runoff. And, 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 and I think that has a significant implication for, uh, for Bloody Brook. And, and I think that's a really, really important issue that we can't just defer to the Con Conservation Commission. We need to understand that and line it up. Is that a benefit? Is it, is, does the benefit outweigh that particular detriment? But if, if my fellow board members don't wanna do that, and want to rely on the Conservation Commission. I mean, I can't stop them, but I don't think that's that's the proper way to proceed on something like this. Other comments? Mr. Decker, comment? Yes. Yes, Mr. Decker. Well, I happen to own property on both sides of the Bloody Brook, and I'm not opposed to it. Okay, I don't think it's going to raise that much of a difference. Okay, so and I own property on both sides of the brook. Mr. Potter. I guess I'm wondering what, what Mr. Stavursky would suggest um, in, in lieu of um, deferring to the Conservation Committee. Well, so this is why I made the motion to open the public hearing. I think what we should do is take into consideration the DEP, uh, open the, reopen the public hearing, take into consideration just on this, on the environmental issue, not everything else, and, and take into consideration the DEP opinion, its implication. For example, one of the things that uh, Mr. Donahue has done is he's asked the, um, the planning board to postpone their meetings, didn't ask us, but ask them because of a potential appeal of that. You know, uh, it, it, it's just unsettled. We don't know what it means, where it's gonna go, and we're gonna act on, you know, kind of shaky information. And, and um, it's, not, it's, not good, it's not good practice, it's not good business. You should know all the information to make a good decision. And uh, and that's why I think we need to we need to consider it still. I you know uh, I I know I'm speaking to a, an unconvinced choir, so I'll keep my mouth shut. Mr. Potter, yeah, I I want to support that, and I want to bring to the board's attention the idea of uh, liability on both sides. You know, I hear a lot of concern. I think about Liscotti and us being in hot water because. Um, they've met some requirements or um, because there have been other properties that have been granted or because this commercial place exists. Uh, I'm not going to get into all that, but I think we, we are guilty in some respects of leaning in the other direction and um, uh, not doing due diligence to the work at hand. We have a lot of time into February to make this decision. Why wouldn't we reopen the hearing? We know this information exists and we know that, an, uh, 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 as John said, an eminent uh, expert in this field disputes the uh, person in the pocket of our applicant. So we are in many ways leaning towards liability towards, uh, as people have said, we're probably gonna get sued either way from either side. Do we want to lean that way? Is that how we want it to appear that we haven't done our due diligence, that we rushed to a decision when we knew information was alluded to um, and, uh, and that's opening uh, the hearing um, uh, and considering this evidence, uh, giving uh, you know, plenty of 
um, appropriate time, not to push the deadline, but to be um, uh, able to uh, assess the information that was brought to our attention. Um, I, 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 I guess I do agree with John in that. Any other Why comments? Not? Any other comments? I think the issue before us is we have to vote on what we have for information right now. And if the information proves later on to be wrong, then we go back and we correct it. Um, but that's my opinion. And we've got five members. Um, I think we need to make a, uh, someone make a motion that we decide whether we have enough of information to take a vote or to move forward. Um, and I think that's a decision by the five of us voting members to decide if we're comfortable with the information we have to move forward. That's a, that's a decision we all need to make. And I think that's what, what it comes down to. Um, so do I have a motion that we um, make a decision whether we have enough of information right now to move forward or not? Does that sound to you right, Mr. Costa, a reasonable thing for us to do? Well, Bernie, if I may, I maybe. I'm sorry, go ahead, Adam. Well, <clears throat> I just really think it's, it's not our job to speculate. It's our job to deliberate on what's in front of us. And we closed the public hearing 10 months after it opened. And I understand that in all of the aspects that we have, whether it be traffic flow, community uh, needs, there's difference of opinion. And experts can provide and have provided opinions on both sides of the issue. Experts also, we also had peer review. Peer review also happened. Um, you know, uh, on these issues. And I feel as though we have the information that we should have when we closed our public hearing. And I don't feel as though we should speculate about what could or couldn't be out there. I feel as though that that's improper. And it's not our purview um, specifically, our broad purview is detrimental to the environment or not. Is this development of this property, commercial property, um, that uh, the opposing, the law lawyer hired by the opposition in September said was developable property. And, and so to me, that there's consistency that the property is in fact developable. Now, that makes me believe, and, and I believe that this building is not gonna be detrimental to the environment. And I understand that it is, everything can be detrimental. You cut one tree down, it's not good for the environment. I get that, but we have to, weigh these things out that property is going to be developed it's how we all have our houses i mean you know if we could snapshot back and i'll go back to 1700s and say no more development that's it you know would would the world be a better place yes for the for the people that are here of course it would be um but we've had a lot of development and we have to have development to keep uh, us going and <clears throat> people also that have property have the right to develop it and, you know, I just think about all these things and this piece of property. And, you know, I know um, we have to, you know, some people feel as though that we can't think about what other things could go there. And I think as though, especially for this project, for this part of this project, we should think about the totality of the circumstances if we deny this, this based on environmental impact. Um, 
that someone could build something by right that could create uh, much more detriment to the environment. Um, you know, and I, and I think things will get sorted out um, with these issues or, or the project will be stopped if the issues rise to that level. But at face value, when you think about a year almost or 10 months, if any issue were to arise that is so detrimental that would stop the project, you think it would have arisen when the town's peer review engineers took, it, took, took issues with it or if they took issues with it. So, you know, I don't think that that these issues are going to raise to the level that the property is going to become undevelopable. And as our lawyer already, as Mr. Costa, our lawyer already said tonight that if something major has to get changed, then they have to come back. Or the applicant has to come back. And, you know, I think as long as Mr. Chair and Mr. Costa uh, are okay with it, maybe the applicant should speak to whether or not he wants to withdraw, like we give every applicant the choice to, or if they're looking for a vote, or if we should delay. Um, I don't know if that's 100% pro proper. And I know that, you know, and this is also a special permit is, is different than, um, than a variance, that's for sure. Um, the variance is, is a whole nother, another story, but um, I mean, I, it's, you know, 8.15, I don't know how late you want to go tonight, Mr. Chair, but uh, I, I think that, you know, we can, we can get some type of consensus on where the board stands um, on these issues and, and, and decide if we want to, if we want to wait or not. I, I could go either way and waiting. And I, and I would ask Mr. Costa if it's appropriate, if, you know, if the applicant should speak to that. And, and it does seem different. <clears throat> Why it does seem odd, Mr. Sabersky, that they would ask the planning board to wait and not, and not us, but uh, I, I have no, I, that's all I have for right now. Thank you. Uh, may I ask a question, Mr. Costa, uh, Bernie? Yes. Uh, Mr. Costa, can we wait and rely on the actions of other boards in town before we render a decision to consider uh, how they have uh, handled the issue and what they've learned in the chairman? within the so, 90 day period that we have to make a decision? So through you, Mr. Chair. So um, certainly you can, you can utilize the 90 days that you're entitled to. So you, you are under no obligation to uh, make a decision uh, or give definitive direction tonight if you're not prepared to do so. That's up to you as a board. Um, but the fact that you deliberate for 89 days versus deliberate for 15 or 20 or 30 days doesn't mean that what occurs in the interim, whether it's occurring um, due to actions of the applicant, due to actions of uh, neighbors or residents, or due to actions of other boards is properly before you. What's before you is what was brought before you during the public hearing process. So if what I think you're asking is, you know, could, could you wait the full 90 days or close to it into January or even February to see if in the interim, there's a uh, there's further action by the conservation commission that would uh, would require a project redesign or a denial by the planning board of the site plan review. You know those actions. Number one, really don't don't speak directly to the criteria that your board is tasked with applying. But second of all, even if they did tangentially somehow relate to those criteria. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be a proper consideration for your board because it happened after the public hearing was closed and not, it's not part of the record that you're tasked with um, uh, uh, evaluating and basing your decision on, unfortunately. Can we reopen the, the public hearing based upon the actions of the Conservation Commission or Planning Board? I would not advise you to reopen the public hearing simply as a result of actions by the Conservation Commission or Planning Board. But that's not to say that the substance that, that gave rise to the, the, the actions by the Conservation Commission or Planning Board couldn't be a basis for reopening the hearing. In that regard, I stand by the opinion I gave a couple of hours ago, which was 
it's really left to your discretion, but certainly before you're rendered a decision to reopen the public hearing, if you think that new information has come to light that is, is critical to your decision-making process. So that would be the procedure that if that, you know, this DEP opinion is pretty, pretty new, you don't know how it's all going to unfold. And, uh, and if it, if it amounts to something significant, uh, we could move to open up the public hearing if the information that's developed as a result of the DEP opinion. Um, so in, in, in that respect, uh, Adam and my fellow board members, you know, I would move, um, that we delay a decision for at least 30 days um, uh, to see um, to see uh, if new information materializes that may might affect our ability to to look at their criteria. If it doesn't, uh, you know, we can go forward. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Mr. Decker. A number of years ago, I was personally involved with a notice, a superseding order by the Department of EEP. Okay. Uh, we filed the appeals and uh, it took a substantial amount of time to get the appeal heard. And it didn't come through until after the property had been, been sold to another party. Okay, it takes a considerable amount, or it did at the time, take a considerable amount of time to uh, get it, a uh, hearing date set up. And the hearing wasn't set up for a good year at that time, if my memory is, is correct. And by the time it came, we'd already agreed to sell the property to somebody else. But uh, it takes a significant amount of time. Uh, and in between we, uh, the appeal, we did file a notice of intent. And when we filed the notice of intent, uh, we got an order of conditions, which we complied with. Uh, but it does take a long time to appeal a superseding order from the Department of Public Utility, uh, Public DEP, okay? And uh, now the developer, I think, and I'm not an expert at it, has the option of appealing the superseding order and, and or also filing a notice of intent, okay? And, uh, you know, it takes, that's their decision they, they're going to make as to how they want to go forward, but they have two ways, two things that they can do. So my point is, um, it could take, I don't think 30 days is going to uh, solve the problem uh, by any matter of means. I think that you're probably talking at a minimum, the 89th day from when we close the hearing, because that, that probably is more likely to, it would fall through in that period, but I, I don't think we'd be doing a due diligence to put it off that long. But if the board wants to continue it for the 89 days from that hearing date, I'm not going to sit here and object to it because I don't want to have somebody say we didn't listen. Mr. Chair. Yes. Um, well, I think I'm at the point where I'd be inclined to make a motion to adjourn for this evening. Um, and then we can reconvene uh, on January 14th, if that works for Mr. Costa. That would be our regular meeting night. Second. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, Jen. Do we know how many other hearings we have for that date? Because I maybe would consider doing a separate date because these meetings seem to take. Well, Jen, I start, Adam, sorry to interrupt, but we've gone through the criteria. We have all basically said where we stand on it. So I don't think a lot's going to change. I think most of the discussion has taken place would think that we would be able to either approve or deny this and recommend either the, the, the uh, language that we're denying it on or conditions in a short period, a shorter period of time than tonight. Uh, I, I 
Okay, I was just putting it out there. Whatever you guys decide, I'm just was wondering. If well, I mean, the, I mean, I don't want to to hold it up too too much longer. But I mean, I think if 30 days from now is our regular meeting night, I mean, we've spent <clears throat> two and a half hours on this issue, so. I don't, I don't know as if we need to spend more time on it tonight. And Mr. Sabursi second it, but does that date work for Mr. Costa and everybody here, Alex? Yes. I, I think we need, what we need to do is first of all, we have to decide if we have enough of information right now. And if we don't, then we have to make them, we have we to be decided that Bernie, we decided that we decided that in October, we closed the public I, here. I understand that, but it would be if we have enough of information to make a decision is what I'm saying. That's what I'm saying. If we don't think we have enough, then we continue the meeting. I think well, that, you mean enough of agreement. Right, exactly. Enough exactly. Of so we well, don't. To, Bernie Adam speaking again, sorry for the minutes, but you, you can't say information. We can't be pulling more. I'm sorry, I'm using the long term. Do we, are we comfortable with what we have been told that we can make a decision? I am, that's why I didn't second John. Okay. Motion. Okay, so make a motion that we're going to, we'll take a vote on it. We're going to vote on going to January uh, 4th. Okay, if that's what you want to do, then that's fine. I don't have a problem with it. Well, it, you're the chair. I mean, you, you, I just, that's my, that's our normal meeting night. Yep. Okay, so. Is what, that good for the applicant and our lawyer? Okay. Well, let's, Alex, do you, how do you feel on this whole deal? You want to wait? Um, I, I guess I have a, a question. Um, yep. If we um, come to a consensus on January 14th, is that going to be enough time to um, draft a decision, uh, review that, um, and any conditions if we... Uh, go that route. Um, I just want to make sure that we're giving ourselves enough time to, you know, so we're not rushing at the last, you know, at the last minute to get things done. Um, okay. Uh, my question is, uh, <coughs> I don't have the information. What is our 89th day? February 10th is your deadline. I'm, I'm sorry, what did you say? February 10th is the 90th day. Okay. We have 10 days, Alex, this is Adam speaking again, for legal counsel to write up our decision either way and then formally vote it. Is that correct, Mr. Costa? Uh, no. So if you meet on, February, on January 14th, the, the deadline to file a decision with the town clerk's office would be February 10th. So between January 14th, when you can continue your deliberations and give me direction as to the sort of decision you want me to draft, you would need to find time within the next three and a half weeks to meet again, to draft, to, to review the draft decision that I've prepared, to vote that draft decision, including discussing the conditions, and then to get it to the town clerk's office. Comfortable with that, Alex? Uh, I think so. Yes. With that? Yeah. Did that answer your question? Okay. Yeah. Um, Mr. Decker, comments? Well, I just think, no, I, I'm fine with the continuing it out as Adam has requested. I just think that at some point in time, uh, council should start to consider it, have some indication of whether or not. Uh, the board is going to likely grant the permit pending any additional information or whether they're going to want to deny it. So he can start drafting this stuff because we're kicking again and we're kicking again, we're kicking again, but I'm willing to wait. Other comments. Okay, so I assume I, 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 this is how I'd like to do it. I'd like to take a vote that we continue the meeting to January 14th. We'll take a, we'll take a vote on that right now so that we know that's what, that's what we want to do, uh, a consensus vote, and we, we go from there. 
All right. Do I have a motion to continue? The, I think you made it already, Adam, didn't you? And Mr. I seconded it. I, I made the motion. So we're all set there. Okay. Well, it, we all set with the applicant and our lawyer because they both, we should give them the opportunity. Yes. Thank you. Thank yes. you. Mr. Donahue. Sorry. Yeah, we'll make the 14th work if that's what we're doing. Okay. Thank you. I think we're all set then. I, I assume we are all in agreement that we can go the 14th. Okay. And what time are we going to make this for? A 6 p.m. or our... a 6 work for everybody? Jennifer, Jennifer is saying 7 with her with fingers because she can't talk. <laughs> 7 p.m.? 7 p.m. Is that what you guys usually do is 7? Well, we, we all have early crib time, so... We start earlier, we end earlier. Okay, six is fine. Did that well, work for everybody, six? Six o'clock on January 14th. Uh, that's on our agenda. <coughs> okay, uh, any other business? Uh, make a motion to adjourn. Okay, second by anybody? Second. Oh, second. Okay. Hold it, oh. hold it. Oh. We want to vote Mr. on Trump the other one. On what? We need a roll call vote on it. Postponement. Uh, you know, uh, we need a roll call I, vote. On uh, I don't think we do because if we are moving to adjourn, this just continues to roll into our next meeting. We do it anyway. Okay, we'll do it anyways. Okay, vote to continue the meeting on January fourteenth at six o'clock. Mr. Decker. Yes. Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. I vote yes. Alex? Yes. And Mr. Stabersky? Yes. Okay. It carries unanimously five, a five to zero that we'll continue on January 14th and at six o'clock. Now, uh, do I have a motion to close? The move to adjourn. Move to adjourn. Do I have a second? Seconded, Adam Sokolowski. Okay. Okay, move to adjourn. Uh, <coughs> adjourn. Um, Mr. Decker. Yes. Mr. Sokolowski. Yes. Mr. Sadowski. Yes. Uh, Alex. Yes. And John. Unanimous, we are going to adjourn and we'll be back. Um, is that our next meeting? I <laughs> Unless you decide to call. No, we meeting tomorrow night at seven o'clock. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Okay. Hearing. All right. <laughs> All right. Jen, can I just talk with you a second? With me? Yes. Yep. I'm going to be a little bit late tomorrow. I have to bring my wife to the doctors and I'll be in Athol at four o'clock. I hopefully I'll be back for seven. And if not, if not, um... Adam, can he call in from his phone or? Oh, my cell phone, really? Really? I know your phone is bad, sorry. <laughs> All right. Really? Do you want do you want Kathy to chair? Get Kathy chaired if I'm not there. Okay, perfect. Okay. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen, for your patience. Um it's been a it's been long and I, I know we're on each other. It, it gets on their nerves and we we we've done a good job and I'm confident we'll do the right thing. Thank you and good night, gentlemen. See you tomorrow.